okay, I'm going to try to give you an overview of uh, the regulations from a global perspective. Uh, it, my talk will be a little bit uh, US FDA centric, obviously, but uh, I'm going to try to make sure that we weave in the global as well. So let's get started. I can do the slides. Nope, that's the corner. Okay, so we're going to start with the punchline first. So uh, the learning objectives of this lecture, uh, hopefully when I finish, you'll have a ability to describe uh, sort of the historical evolution of regulations. You'll be able to uh, explain the roles and responsibilities of national regulatory authorities, and you'll also be able to describe uh, the different stages of the regulatory review process. And then I'll throw in some other tidbits along the way, but this is what you need to uh, try to comprehend. So the presentation outline, I'll start with a, a brief introduction, followed by a little bit on history, the legal framework, an overview of the national regulatory authorities, the role of the World Health Organization in regulation, stages of review and regulation, approval pathways, and then I'll sum up. So let's start with the basic and the fundamentals. The regulation of the vaccines, there are two, two pillars, really. The legal framework, and it requires a sound medical, scientific, and technical knowledge and skills. That's the basis to any regulatory authority. Now, during the uh, 18th century or the 19th century, there was a renaissance, so to speak, in uh, the, the life sciences, uh, chemistry, physiology, pharmacology, and these really laid the foundation for pharmaceutical sciences and really developed research and development in uh, new and innovative products, including vaccines. And this really started to flourish after the Second World, World War. And this was really the evolution of the uh, regulatory authorities as well, uh, the determination that uh, with all this innovation, somebody needs to regulate this stuff. Um, so um, moving on to the historical perspective, uh, generally it takes a, tra a tragedy or a number of tragedies for governments to move forward, to do something. Uh, and so uh, historically, there were a number of tragedies, as I talked about in the previous slide, these innovations, but it was like uh, what we would call in the U.S., the wild, wild west. People were doing whatever they wanted to do without any control. So one example was in, in 1901, you had 14 children died of a contaminated diphtheria. Uh, this product uh, had no facility controls, no product safety testing. In 1938, uh, over 100 people died in the U.S. of diethylene glycol poisoning. Again, uh, this is use of a chemical solvent without any safety testing. And then you're probably all familiar with the Cutter incident in 1955, where a polio inactivated polio virus vaccine was not properly inactivated. And so uh, kids got polio from the vaccine. And then there have been numerous other examples of these tragedies in the, between 1958 and 1960. We had uh, tens of thousands or, or thousands of babies dying uh, with uh, or, or having deformities uh, due to thalidomide. And so, again, governments needed to step in and say, well, you know, we, we probably need to control or regulate some of this. And so... Uh, this was the impetus. This, the, the, these were examples of the impetus of uh, bringing on uh, regulations. And so the establishment of legislation as to establish and strengthen uh, using the U.S. FDA as an example, in 1902, uh, after the incident with the uh, diphtheria, so they passed the Virus Serum and Tox Antitoxin Act. And this act, it's hard to believe that before that, you know, so the establishment, this had to be licensed to a facility where you're making the product. It was a requirement that they're licensed. It had to, they'd established that to uh, distribute, market a product, you had to have a product license. You have the, uh, the agency started controlling labeling. You couldn't say, you know, anything uh, about these products. I mean, if you look at some of the old stuff, it, it looks like the products were, they would do everything from, you know, you could uh, clean your face in the morning to cure cancer with uh, a product. 
Um, and so, again, the, the labeling requirements, inspections of facilities, uh, and then really key is enforcement, the ability for an agency to suspend or uh, revoke a license, therefore, thereby putting uh, a bad player, if you will, out of business. And then in 1906, the Food and Drug Act was established, and this was really the beginning of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in the United States. And then uh, in 1938, under the Roosevelt administration, the federal it was it was changed to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and that required pre-marketing notification requirements for new drugs. Prior to that, there was no pre-market notification. So these were the sort of the basic laws, and there were many many other laws uh, created by Congress to um, sort of protect the public health from uh, these products. And so I mentioned earlier that there needs to be a legal framework. Every regulatory authority or system needs to have a, re, uh, a, a, a legal framework because if you don't have a legal framework, how do you get your authority? The agencies don't have authority without, you know, the legislative branch of the government. And so most governments, uh, there's an executive branch, there's a top branch. And this is the this is the branch of government that establishes institutions like the FDA, the NIH, CDC. So they establish these institutions, and then they also uh, define the functions of these institutions and how these institutions are structured. And these institutions I just mentioned, they're part of the executive branch, but it's the legislative branch or the Congress of the United States uh, that is. Uh, responsible for creating the laws. So you have these agencies, but it takes Congress to decide, all right, what is the law that we're going to uh, require you to enforce? What is the legal framework to give you that authority to regulate these products? And then, most importantly, what can you regulate? And many of you probably heard some things that, you know, we've had some products out there and they're like, well, Shouldn't the, shouldn't the regulatory authority be uh, uh, overseeing that product? And some not. It depends on Congress. Congress decides uh, the scope of the products regulated. But this gives you, this, this regulatory system, uh, legal framework gives the ability for uh, enforcement. And so most important to the regulator is the assessment of benefit risk. The regulators are really... The, the, that's the institution, or these are the institutions that are the risk assessors. Now, the national regulatory authorities, they're responsible for evaluating the benefits and risks for the population through the, uh, through the uh, evaluation of data. Um, they will make the determination of whether something is, uh, the benefits outweigh the risk. It's up to the healthcare provider to determine the benefits and risks for his or her patient. The provider is also, uh, you heard the term, the NITAX this morning, these are the recommending bodies. Uh, and, the, and the associations, like the American Medical Association, the, the, the uh, American Academy of Pediatricians, these are, uh, they represent providers, and they will evaluate the benefits and risks for the patients and also make recommendations for the patients. And then we as individuals, the patient, we evaluate the benefits and risks in terms of our personal values. So, for instance, if the government says we recommend X vaccine to be given to this population, you as an individual may say, I don't think so. I'm not going to take that. And then you have that choice as, uh, you know, as evaluating the benefit risk for yourself. But it's the National Regulatory Authority. That's the front door. That's the group that protects you and makes sure that these products are safe and effective, but recognizing that safety and effectiveness are relative. And we can get into that with some questions. And so the WHO has, or the World Health Organization, also has a role in vaccine regulation. The WHO, although they are not a national regulatory authority, they do play a significant and important role in regulation. They're involved in consolidating consensus opinions on regulatory issues. They're involved with the national regulatory authorities as far as the scientific background needed to assess certain issues. 
They're involved in uh, developing standards uh, through their ex expert committees. They're also involved in, in uh, capacity building as far as strengthening uh, regulatory authorities or helping to develop regulatory authorities in countries where there may not be a regulatory authority. And then uh, most important, they're involved in ensuring the quality, safety, and efficacy of medicines through their pre-qualification program, which I'll touch on in a minute. And then, of course, they also facilitate the exchange of regulatory information among regulators. And so I mentioned the pre-qualification program at WHO, and that's really to, a question came up this morning, and to, to, to really clarify that question, the, the pre-qualification program, it's really to ensure the quality, efficacy, and safety of medicines, but in, most importantly, those medicines that are procured using international funds to serve patients in developing countries. So the question this morning was about, well, um, is that product, uh, I think when, when the gentleman from India was speaking, is that product pre-qualified? Well, India has a national regulatory authority, and the national regulatory authority makes that decision whether those pro for their own country because they're, they're, the country is procuring those products. If it's UNICEF or someone or uh, agency like that procuring the products in, in for developing countries, it may be the WHO that goes – uh, goes through the pre-qualification process or evaluation for countries to be able to do that. And so they they look at quality, safety, and efficacy. They do inspections of manufacturers and monitoring the products for their quality. Uh, they look at pre-qualification of the control laboratories uh, in these uh, particular countries as well who are um, have products that uh, are applying for pre-qualification. And then it's also, uh, importantly, they're building capacity of, of regulations, manufacturers, and quality control labs. So to really increase the capacity in the developing countries that may not have a, a mature national regulatory authority. And then the WHO also has what they call a, a global benchmarking tool. And this benchmarking tool is very important uh, for evaluating. First of all, they develop this uh, benchmarking tool. Then they use the benchmarking tool. Oops, go back here. How do I go backwards on here? Oh, there, good, thanks. Uh, then they use the benchmarking for the national regulatory systems to, to evaluate that, and then uh, in the evaluation, using the benchmarking tool for the evaluation of the national regulatory authorities, they, the national regulatory authorities, in collaboration with the WHO, will perform, uh, develop an institutional development plan. And this institutional plan is really to assess uh, where they are, where the national regulatory authority may be, and then those things that they need to do to improve their systems. And then... Uh, lastly, they provide technical support. The WHO provides technical support, training, and also learning, networking for that evolving national regulatory authority. And then WHO also monitors the progress and impact. And through this benchmarking tool, uh, working with uh, uh, early um, national regulatory authorities, this uh, really provides capacity building, global capacity building, so you'll have strong national regulatory authorities uh, in, in uh, more countries. And then they can also be, their countries then, can, the producers or in those countries might be able to pre-qualify a vaccine uh, because part of pre-qualification is also the having a mature uh, uh, regulatory authority. So you've heard me mention national regulatory authorities and RAs. What do they do? They really are the guardians. They're the gatekeeper to ensure the safety, efficacy, and quality of vaccines, drugs made available to the to the public. That is that is the door to get through, uh, and they're responsible for that. They're also in, in responsible for ensuring compliance. So there's a police role, if you will. Uh, they will make sure that uh, manufacturers are adhering to the rules and regulations uh, and their products are in compliance 
with the regulatory and um, the legal and regulatory aspects of the vaccines. And then the enforcement component of the regulations, making sure that the guidelines to regulate uh, products are for licensing, manufacturing, marketing, and labeling. And it's important enforcement is, is, is a really key component because you could be, you know, you've heard the term a paper tiger. You could be a regulatory authority, but if you don't have any enforcement ability, the manufacturers can do whatever they want because they know that the regulatory authority is not going to bite their hand uh, if they are out of compliance. At the same time, it's important to understand that the regulatory authority uh, shouldn't be uh, so so blind and guided by the laws that um, they're, they overregulate, if you will. And so you want to make sure that there's flexibility or what we call enforcement discretion. Uh, and so you have to weigh that. Again, enforcement discretion is, is about uh, look, evaluating benefit risk. And these are just examples of NRAs on the slide. I don't, I'm not going to read this. What I tried to do was put at least one regulatory authority from each continent on the slide. So hopefully I've done that. And then I, I'm not going to go through this entire slide, but I wanted to give you some examples of regulatory authorities and just how, the, how they've evolved. And as you can see, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is probably one of the oldest um, regulatory authorities. I have 1906 and 1902. 1902 was because uh, vaccines were regulated prior to drugs. And so it was important that, uh, so for, for in the US FDA, vaccines were started to be regulated in 1902, drugs started in 1906. But then you can see the, the uh, EMEA uh, established in 1995. But importantly, the member states in Europe they all have national regulatory authorities. And, and so the European uh, EMEA is a centralized process. And I'll mention a, uh, something about that shortly. And then there's 1940 in India, uh, 1950 in China, and 1992 in Ghana. And these are just some examples. And you can read uh, the slide later, uh, some of the specifics on these regulatory authorities. So switching gears now to the process, the stages of review and regulation, uh, there are really three stages. You have the investigation of new drug application stage, which is IND in the U.S. This gives the, uh, the allows uh, a company or sponsor to actually do a trial, the first in human trial, uh, and, and trials thereafter, but it's, it requires a per, uh, permission from the Food and Drug Administration to do that. Many of you know that there are four phases to the IND stage, uh, phase one, two, and three, safety immunogenicity, safety immunogenicity, dose ranging, and then as you go up, efficacy studies. And these studies, uh, they vary in size. The size increases as, as you go up into phase three. You also, uh, many of you are aware that there's overlap now. So you might do a phase 1B, phase 2B, and although that's not in the regulations, that's where we are now. And so you may not, your phase one study may not be sufficient to go into phase two. So you might amend a phase, a phase two B on that study. So just to give you that. And then as you, after your pivotal phase three study, uh, you move into, if you want to get the product licensed or marketing uh, authorized, uh, it's in the United States, the BLA, uh, Biologics Applic License Application. And this is a review to, of data to support licensure. And then there's a pre-approval inspection uh, with that as well. And then today, many, most, I would say, uh, products that are licensed or approved vaccines, they require uh, post-licensure studies. And these post-licensure studies, this is where the phase four studies comes in. Uh, you may be doing phase four, phase four for additional uh, safety data. You might be also doing phase four for, for efficacy. And then there's lot release, and uh, which continues for the life of the product, as well as your uh, periodic inspections of the manufacturing facility as uh, as you move forward. And so, just to drill down a little deeper, and this is a very complex slide, but in itself, 
if you just look at the slide, it, it gets the message across. The process is complex. One thing that I didn't mention is the CMC, which I'm not going to talk about today, chemistry, manufacturing, and control. That is a critical part of, of, of vaccines. And if you can't manufacture a product, you can have the best clinical data in the world. But if you can't consistently manufacture that product, that product will not be licensed. And so it's important. Um, and so you have, there I go again. Uh, you would think I would figure this out by now. There we go. Uh, so you have development and, and that uh, under development, that's where your CMC is, your chemistry manufacturing and control. And so when you get to, when you get to the development of a, 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 a investigator or a research developer, you get a gleam in your eye about a new product. That gleam, that's free. That's an unregulated <laughs> environment. Once you develop that product, then you start entering into the regulatory space and you gotta adhere to some rules. And so you have development, uh, developing the manufacturing process. You move into preclinical, your animal studies. And then if those are successful, you move into the IND or investigation or new drug stage, phase one, two, and three, as I've talked about previously. Those are your clinical trials. And then if you're successful, you go into a BLA review and then post-marketing. But as you can see up, uh, up on the sides of this slide, the, the FDA is all over this. You have meetings with the agency. You have meetings with the national regulatory authorities in many countries to talk about, you know, what do you have? What data do you have? What, what are you trying to do with this product? Where are you going? Uh, you discuss the preclinical data. Are the preclinical data satisfactory enough to uh, convince the regulators that it, this is fine to go into first in human? in that IND stage, uh, and then later on into the BLA. But there are meetings and meetings, many meetings with the agency, and that's encouraged. I mean, you don't, it's one thing you don't want to do as a product developer is not meet with your regulatory authority, because if you don't meet up with them in the beginning, you're going to meet them at the end, and you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> so you cannot get through it uh, without. So why not, why not take advantage of the free meetings? The taxpayers in your countries are... Uh, paying for that meeting, so take advantage of it. So, but this is a very complex product. Uh, I mean, process five to ten years on average for uh, getting a vaccine license, at least in the United States. Sometimes longer. I mean, even though COVID, we got in eight eight months, but that's another story I'll tell you about later. <laughs> and then in the United States, there are three pathways: the traditional approval pathways, your your typical randomized controlled trials accelerated approval to really address unmet needs. And this process is based on a surrogate endpoint. And we can talk about a little bit more about that if you have questions uh, in the session. And then the animal rule, which is an extremely difficult uh, a route to approval. And uh, this requires, if there's, if there's a possibility of doing a human efficacy study, then this pathway is not, not available. But there's some hybrids that I'll talk about, I can talk about in the question and answer session, where you can identify biomarkers maybe with an animal model and then do human studies, but I can talk about that later. But these are the three path basic pathways to license a product in the U.S. And then in Europe with the EMEA, there are four processes. You have the centralized process. That's what the EMEA does through the European Medicines Agencies. Then you have applications to the designated national bodies within a single EU state of the 28, one of the 28 states. Then there's mutual recognition after approval in a single state. And then the decentralized process, that's where um, the uh, simultaneous application in multiple EU, state, EU, EU states. But the MEA process is historically, it was based on products that are, are like recombinants, uh, new technologies, but most of your vaccines are in that category anyhow now. So your vaccines are generally going to EMEA. Uh, and then there are expedited review pathways. These pathways are used to really address unmet needs where, you know, there is a, a, a really critical uh, situation where you need to move products through the regulatory authority uh, rapidly. And thankfully, these have been codified into regulations where they can do that. Uh, fast track, breakthrough therapy, and accelerated approval, 
and priority review in the United States. Fast track is not really fast. It just gives you the ability. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it just gives you the ability to tell people you got a product. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. It's not fast. <laughs> but you also get some extra help. So, you know, you, you get the ability, at least in the United States, you, you get the uh, attention. If you get fast track uh, designation, you get the attention of the FDA, uh, more attention, let's say it that way. Breakthrough therapy, similar situation. Uh, and, and, and again, it helps to have that attention because, you know, through the process, there, there's numerous questions. And if you don't have one of these pathways, then you have to follow the, you know, it's, it's, it is slower to get a meeting and you only get so many meetings. And accelerated approval is accelerated in a sense that it's based on a surrogate endpoint where that's reasonably likely to uh, 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 demonstrate a clinical benefit. We, we don't know it, but it's it's reasonably likely. And so you can go that route. And then a priority review is just a designation of the review time in the United States, six months versus 10 months. And the EMA also launched a uh, prime scheme to strengthen its support in the development of medicines that address unmet needs. And then there's emergency use. You have emergency use authorization in the U.S. Uh, the EMEA has conditional marketing authorization for emergency use. And then there's emergency use listing procedure, and that's from the WHO. And that allows the use of an unapproved medical product or unapproved use of a medical product. And then uh, I wanted to just mention a little bit about protecting the integrity of a regulatory agency. And this is really important. Because, I mean, what we experienced during the COVID period, the NRAs, they're really uniquely tasked to objectively evaluate product safety and efficacy. And this is a critical role during public health emergencies when other stakeholders typically have conflicting political or economic interests. And you really don't want the, the, the politicians or, 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 or you know, those type of individuals really interfering with the process. And we saw that with COVID where uh, we saw governments really, I think, overstepping their bounds. And so um, with regulatory decisions, the benefit-risk judgments, especially in an emergency, these need to be made uh, based on an unbiased and deliberate process. They have no room for politicians or other individuals inserting themselves into the process. This is the independence of the National Regulatory Authority. And the stronger the National Regulatory Authority, the more independence they have. But you all saw that even in the United States, we had our issues. And so in summary, the regulation of vaccines, they, oper they have to operate within a legal framework. The NRA is, serves as the guardians. They're the protectors of uh, individuals for safety, efficacy, and quality of, of vaccines and other human medical products. And what the NRA really does is they need to provide strategic, tactical, and operational direction. But these need to be done within the regulations, balancing the benefits and the risks, while providing flexibility. So you, you have to provide some flexibility based on the science. Science changes, and so you, you, you can't be very narrow. You have to look at the, look at the overall science. And so they should be scientifically support, supported. And, and the role is not just compliance, enforcement, but it's also to expedite the development and delivery of safe and effective products to individuals throughout the world. Thank you. And now and again, they remind the president that inhaling bleach might not be a great idea. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you, Norman. That was great. And we have some time for questions. Uh, hands shooting up already. Yes. And uh, if you're a first time question answer, use your finger to tell me that. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice presentation. Maybe just uh, Santosh with uh, the WHO EPI team in headquarters. So just two, uh, two questions. Maybe I think you mentioned the expedited review and the accelerated approval, right? And in WHO, we have something like EUL, right? The emergency use of listing, if that's a similar process. And just can you walk us through in terms of the EUL, the PQ, and its relation with the NRA? That's one. And the second thing is, uh, it didn't come in the presentation, just 
I wanted to know the off-label use, right? Like who really determines the off-label use? Is it, is it country specific or is it at the global level? Is it WHO? Can you expand a little sure, bit? Sure, sure. Um, now, <laughs> The, uh, the, the, I could talk all day about the emergency use and I, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> so, but it's, it's really for emergencies. And in, in the United States, I mean, there's legislation that t- talks about how that process works. And I, I think you have these slides. So I have some backup slides to describe the process. Uh, and I, I there are similarities in all of these with the conditional marketing. It's really to get these products, uh, to, uh, to use as soon as you can. And so it is an abbreviated process. Uh, it is the, the data are limited, uh, but it's again, recognize that there's an emergency uh, and these products will be evaluated as rapidly as possible. I mean, that's the situation with the COVID and why these vaccines were able to uh, move forward. But keep in mind, these are not approval pathways. These are for emergencies. And most of the most of the vaccines, at least in the United States, are still not approved. They're still under EUA, although some indications from uh, population, some ages have been approved. But these products are not all approved. Uh, but again, the, the 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 data and the evaluation of the data are limited. Although you know what, these trials had thirty something thousand, the Pfizer was thirty something, the Moderna was thirty something. So these were large trials, but they were really like your CMC part. That part was the value was abbreviated. Um, your uh, inspections, though, that part was was uh, abbreviated, just to be able to move these products forward in 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 a situation like that. But again, only for emergencies. Oh, and the second part of your question was. Um, off label. Off label is handled by the NITAX or the, the C, CDC. The, the FDA, I served as the liaison for the CDC, uh, the FDA's li, uh, liaison for CDC. So I sat on the ACIP and so they would be discussing, uh, off label use and I was cringing in my seat. But I, I you know, it's like, and then they turned to me and says, well, what do you think? And I said, you know what I think? We don't, I don't support off label use, use, but that's, I don't have that authority. My authority is to evaluate the product, and your authority as a NITAC or provider is to uh, look at the benefit risk for the population. So sometimes there will be differences between what the regulator approves and what the recommending body uh, recommends. I think there it's getting narrower, though, because there's a lot of discussion between the NITACs and, and the regulators. So there are times when off-label use is fine, but it should be based on data. Yeah, sometimes data and sometimes insight, like the <laughs> dose interval for the COVID vaccines. Yeah. We may want to discuss at some point. Yes, you next. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Cristiana Campa from GSK. I have a question on, uh, uh, let's say, the COVID learnings, right? So... We have seen some cooperation among uh, regulatory agencies to, to support COVID vaccines development and deployment, right? I, uh, ICMRA, uh, regulatory adv- advisory group for SEPI and other things. What are the learnings in this space for the future, right? Just to, to make this more sustainable because manufacturers struggle with diversity of feedback from authorities, especially for low-income uh, countries. Yeah, that's, that, that's a hard one, especially access. Uh, but I think we, we really, I would like to see more convergence of the regulatory authorities. So when we, we can, we should be able to come to an agreement that this is the protocol that we're going to use. So we're going to use one protocol, not FDA's protocol, EMA's protocol, everybody has a protocol. No, we're going to agree on this protocol and we're going to make sure that we have uh, uh, addressed the needs of, of the world and and then move that forward and move that product forward so that we can all evaluate that product together. But the, one of the challenges is access because how do you – you can't really force a company to – to supply one region versus the other. So that's, that's a real challenge. And it's, I think that goes beyond the regulators because we're all, we're always going to have that, you know, we always have that discrepancy between a manufacturing country 
and countries that don't manufacture vaccines. So you've heard things like, well, we need to, we, and WHO, you know, they, they, they try to move this forward as well, that we're increasing manufacturing capacity globally. And you've heard companies say that. Moderna said they were going to, and I think it's moving slow, but they said that they would also build, uh, help build and train uh, individuals and, and facilities in uh, developing countries. And that will help a lot. But those facilities and those, they need to have strong regulatory authorities in those countries as well. So it's, it's, it's something that's really needed, but it's not, it's not very straightforward because we're dealing with humans. Governments, governments seem to like to have factories making vaccines, especially when there's a pandemic going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who's next? Yeah. Go in the red. Hi, Parada from Pfizer. So I'm curious about your perspective on the need or not for clinical trials for strain changes um, for vaccines that, you know, uh, need to be updated for COVID. You know, is it going to be uh, in line with seasonal flu, et cetera? Um, I always would like to have data. <laughs> I'm a regulator. But, you know, for flu, it's, it's, it's different because we have experience. Flu was licensed in the, in the United States in 1946. Hadn't changed much from the manufacturing, and manufacturing really defines the product. So we have a lot of experience with that. I mean, with the mRNA-based vaccines, we don't have a lot of experience. And so uh, I, I, I was public, you know, but when the COVID vaccines were developed. I went public and said, I think there needs to be some data uh, as you make these strain changes. And so, but with, with time and with experience, maybe we can get away from that. But that's just that's just my opinion. But I, you know, you especially relations vulnerable populations, you you want to have some idea that it's it's, it's going to continue to work without a feeling. You know, I really believe that uh, that that w- they will work. But you know, if something bad happens and they come to a regulator and you say, "Well, I really believe that," it just didn't pan out. <laughs> That's not a good place to be. Yeah, six mice is not enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> And in fact, we had this experience in the UK with uh, uh, the the numbers of, of safety, uh, the, the numbers needed for safety studies as new vaccines came in. We we really upped that as we began to realise that you can end up with a vaccine with a very rare but serious side effect. If you've only got a, a safety database of a few thousand individuals, you're never going to pick that up. So, right, who's next? Yes, <clears throat> this is Elena from JSK. Um, I have a question. So how are regulations changing with regard to the acceptability of real-world evidence as opposed to clinical um, randomized cl- control studies? They are changing, and I've, I've seen a lot of progress on this from when that the whole concept of real-world evidence was moving. But it has to be uh, prospective. It can't be ad hoc. And I think a lot of a lot of developers get that mixed up. They say, oh, we got data over here. We've been using it for five years and we got, you know, we got some data. Yeah, you got some data, but do you have a study? I mean, it's, it's, ad, it's, it can't be ad hoc. You have to be really a prospective study to use that real world evidence. And I think it is moving very fast. And in fact, when you are saying you've approved the product on, under accelerated approval in the U.S., so you have to confirm that surrogate. Real world evidence, I mean, I think the agency is looking more positive at studies that have been done to evaluate real world evidence as supportive. I'm not saying that they're ready to approve a product based on real world evidence, but they're definitely at that point now saying we can look at real world evidence in support. Uh, yes, in the middle of the white shirt. Thanks, Michelle Giles from Australia. A related question. What are your thoughts on using correlates of protection, for example, with GBS vaccines, where clinical endpoints may be not feasible and you, you have a, an unmet, ne- unmet need? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm all for correlate for protection. It's like saying I'm all for it, whatever. <laughs> but uh, you have to um, understand that correlates of protection are not required to approve a product. So there's not a requirement. And it sometimes is very difficult to convince investigators and manufacturers to uh, collect data to, to come up with a correlate. But we've used correlates. I mean, if you think about correlates where, we, where they really give us credit, like a hepatitis B, 
You don't have to go and do a huge efficacy study. We know what the biomarker is for that. COVID, on the other hand, we know the, the, the marker or the correlate, if you will, is neutralizing antibodies, but we don't know what level. And so, but we, but they were still able to authorize those, those products without it. Correlates, are, identifying a correlate of protection will, is a huge advantage because when you get ready to do the next product or you get ready to change the product and you have a correlate, it's that much easier to, uh, to approve those uh, changes or to increase in a population of what we call immunobridging. Immunobridging becomes much easier with a correlate of protection. And so the agencies have tried to push, push, push uh, developers to try to identify a correlate of protection. But if we waited to, we identified every correlate of protection for every vaccine, we would still be trying to license polio. <laughs> yeah. And I think the other comment I would make on correlates is that the, the value of the correlate depends on the length of follow-up you've got. So if you have a nice correlate a month after you've given the vaccine, but you've only followed up for six months, you really don't know whether that's going to predict protection at a year. And that's turned out to be very important for COVID. Who's next? A lady with the red hair. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Trina Rassin. I'm from the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, which is part of the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. And I'm just wondering if you can give me your point of view uh, on how regulatory agencies should or will be approaching um, the review of broadly protective vaccines. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, and as an example, say a broadly protective influenza or, you know, and but uh, you know the, the 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 challenge there is what's broadly protective, and how long? And, and flu may maybe flu is easier than something like a COVID because you know we have variants yet to come. I mean, and and so it is it is difficult. But the agencies are looking at this and trying to figure out. I mean, I think we're going to have to chop this up a little bit in 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 pieces and say, all right, broadly protective will mean that you may have protection against. Uh, these strains over a period of say five years or something like that. I mean, to say broadly protective in the, in the literal sense is, is to say, if I give you an influenza vaccine, you're good for life for any strain. Then I would go come back to you and say, how are you going to prove it? What's the clinical study to do that? That's the challenge. Tricky one. Yes. Who's next? Who's got a finger for me? Any first timers? Yes, the lady at the back. Well, two ladies. So first on the left and then on the right. Good. But both, both not both at the same time. Micro oh, it is working. Hi, I'm Catherine. Uh, I'm from the UK. Um, I was curious about the animal rule and if you have any examples where the animal rule has applied or if not a scenario where it might apply. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's only one and <laughs> that, that has been used. And that's the, the uh, anthrax. Uh, TNA, and that was not for de novo. That was for an indication. That's the only. That's the only where, place where animal rule has been used to approve a product. Uh, I would say the animal rule. Any, any, any. As I said in the slides, if you can do a human efficacy study, then you're not eligible to do animal rule. But I think where the middle ground is, as I stated, developing an immunomarker that you can translate into humans. So if you can die, if you and and there's some there's some things out there I can't talk about, but, <laughs> but it's it's smoothie. Let me just tell you that. And so if you can do if you can a potential uh, marker, say in a, in non-human primates, and then extrapolate that into humans, I mean that will abbreviate the the uh, development process. So I think that's where we're going next. And then you immunobridge from the animals into the human, but you still have to do human safety data regardless. So very quickly. I'll be quick. Uh, Kristen Earl, Gates Foundation. Um, I take your point that regulators cannot require, you know, the development of a correlate of protection, but given your comment that they can be incredibly useful for follow-on and next-gen vaccines, I wonder if you think there is a role for regulators to require submission of data that can be used in that global effort to identify a correlate, whether that be inclusion of international standards or use of validated qualified, you know, assays, so that those data at least can be compared to those in development or the global community can work on identifying a correlate, even if it's not in the best interest of that particular developer to do so. 
the 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 problem there is, and I, I agree that I mean the regulators need to do everything they can, and I think they have to push. But there's one important component: the legal framework, the legal authority to require that before I license a product. I don't. The, the national regulatory doesn't have it. I can strongly encourage it. I can push you very far, but I can't. You can also push on me a little bit and say, you know, you can't make me. <laughs> so okay, Norman, thank you very much.